Well, good morning, church. It's so good to be together this morning. Good to see each of you. I hope you've had a good summer so far. I hope you had a good holiday week. It's good to gather together on Sunday, though, in the summertime and to fix our eyes and our hearts and our minds on the Lord through worship and through uh, the teaching of God's word. So it's good to be together this morning. How many of you are glad to be here this morning? Are you glad to be here? Well, I have met a lot of people in my lifetime, but I have not met anyone who likes to wait. Anyone excited when you get on the phone and you're put on hold when you're talking to customer service? Anyone excited about that? Anyone excited to be behind the grandma in the grocery store line when she's got the coupons and and her checkbook out? Even her husband of 50 years isn't excited to be with her at that moment. And what about Six Flags Great America? Standing in line all day. You're there at the park for 10 hours and you ride rides for what? Like seven and a half minutes? (laughs) And the rest of the time is standing in line in the heat. And can we all agree that the DMV is the worst? (laughs) So if you're gonna go and try to get a driver's license, take a lawn chair, pack a lunch, you're going to be waiting a while there. And don't get me started with Chicago sports. (laughs) How long did it take the Cubs to win a World Series before 2016? How many years? 108 years. So at that rate, the Cubs are going to win the World Series again in year 2124. And I'm guessing if the Cubs win in 21-24, they're going to win the World Series before the Bears ever win a Super Bowl. (laughs) And if you're offended by that, the Bears had one good season, 1985, and that was 38 years ago. It's fun to have fun at church. It's fun to laugh at these things. But what if our waiting isn't in the trivial Our waiting isn't in the thing that's inconvenient for a few minutes. What if our waiting is much more personal? What if our waiting is much more substantial in our lives? Like waiting for the medical diagnosis, or waiting for the prodigal child or waiting for the pregnancy test, or waiting to find a spouse, or waiting to find victory and freedom from a destructive habit. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up to Psalm chapter 13. We are in a series this summer called Summer in the Psalms. And so each Sunday we are digging into a fresh psalm. And then throughout the week, we are reading uh, the Psalms together. I hope you have a bookmark. I hope that you have been uh, tracking along with us this summer, not just on Sundays, but also during the week. The title of this message is Worship When Waiting. Worship when waiting in Psalm chapter 13, there's a title even before you get to verse one, the title says this, how long, O Lord, to the choir master, a Psalm of David. So right away, we discover some things about this Psalm. This Psalm was written by David and it was written by David to be sung. That's why he is giving it to the choir master. And the title of this Psalm is how long, O Lord. So we know this psalm is going to be about waiting, but it's also going to be about worship. And so hence the title, Worship in Waiting. Many biblical scholars would believe that this psalm was written by David before David became king. It was written in that extended period of waiting between when he was anointed as king and when he was crowned as king, that extended time of waiting, that extended time of waiting between promise given and promise fulfilled. And it was in this extended time of waiting that David experienced suffering and hardship. He experienced discouragement and even despair. How many of you are there today? Or have been there recently? In a season of waiting. A season of suffering and hardship. A season of discouragement. 
if not flat out despair. If that is you, this message is for you. So let's start with a quick history lesson. Dave, king, uh, Saul was the first king of Israel, but Saul disobeyed God. And because Saul disobeyed God, God rejected Saul. And so God appointed a new king, the best friend of Saul's own son, David. And Saul was furious, and so Saul used all of his available resources to go on a manhunt for David. And it's with that context, David writes Psalm 13. So think about the emotions that are going on in David's life as David is fleeing from King Saul. As David is fighting for his own life, as he writes these words, starting in verse 1. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel from my soul and have sorrow in my heart all my day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider... And answer me, O oh Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. If you're taking notes, and I hope that you are, we're going to look at four truths for worship when waiting. Here's the first truth that we see here. The first truth is this when God is silent, keep listening. When God is silent, keep listening. Where do we see this in the text? Verses one and two. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? How long? Did you catch how many times he wrote how long? Not just once, not twice, not three times, but how many times? Four times. That question, how long, is used 20 times in the book of Psalms. Four times right here in these two verses, how long? When our kids were young, we used to do a lot of road trips together as a family. And uh, Camille's mom lives in Colorado, so that's a long 15-hour road trip day right there. And we have lots of rules at our family road trips. One of our rules is that we only stop when the gas gauge uh, light is on. <laughs> so fortunately, we drive a fairly fuel-efficient Honda Odyssey, that on the highway miles, you can go about 500 miles. That means one stop between Chicago and Colorado in Omaha, Nebraska. The kids have four and a half minutes while I'm gassing up <laughs> to get food and use the bathroom to get back in the car because it's gas and go because we're on a road trip. We got a destination to get to Colorado. If our kids were to write a psalm of lament about family road trips... <laughs> How long, oh father? How long must I stay in this vehicle? Have you forgotten me in the back seat? How long must I sit between my siblings? I feel my enemies pressing on both sides. How long until I can receive relief in my bowels? How long? How long, oh father? I think you get the point. So David asks the question, how long four times? Let's look at this in a real specific way. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? David feels forgotten and forsaken by God. How long will you hide your face from me? He feels like God is playing this cosmic hide and seek with him. How long must I take counsel for my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? Do you see? Can you feel 
the depth of his sadness and his sorrow. In our Finding Freedom series, we talked about the spiral of despair. It starts with disappointment, leads to discouragement, which leads to depression, which leads to despair and despondency. David is feeling sorrow all the day. That's clinical depression right there. He's experiencing despondency. How long shall I, my enemy, be exalted over me? Another way of saying this is, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the bad guys always seem to win? How long, oh Lord? Maybe you've been there before and you're asking yourself, those same questions, how long? How long, O Lord, am I going to be in this situation? How long, O Lord, am I going to have this medical condition? How long am I going to experience this relational issue? How long am I going to be in this financial hardship? How long am I going to have this emotional pain? How long am I going to struggle with sin. You see, David is asking some questions that are like a psychological puzzle. He's asking questions like, why am I feeling this? What's really happening? How long is this going to be? But the problem is, he doesn't have all the pieces of the puzzle, so he can't see things clearly. Have you ever been there before? You're crying out to God, how long? And it feels like he isn't answering you. Can I encourage you just to listen? Can you do what David is doing here in the Psalms? He's taking his emotions to the Lord. And he's talking to the Lord about his feelings. And that leads us to truth number two. Truth number two is this, that when God doesn't seem to answer, keep praying. We see this in verses three and four. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Notice what David doesn't do. David doesn't cope with his emotions by stress eating, by binging on Netflix, by drowning his sorrows in a bottle, by shopping so that he can seem fulfilled, by engaging in pleasures that are never satisfying. What is it that David does? David prays. The secret to prayer is prayer in secret. And so here David is calling out to the Lord. And in this verse, we see that David is praying really three specific things. Do you see them? There are three imperatives. He says, consider, answer, and light up my eyes. First of all, consider, God, do you see me? God, do you see what's going on in my life? God, answer me. God, I need you. God, I need you to show yourself faithful. God, I need you to provide and protect me. And then light up my eyes. This is an interesting uh, set of words here. These wouldn't be words that we would use in our English language, but this would be illuminate me, but illuminate me not just in my mind and in my heart, but also in my body. And so it's praying, God, would you give me hope in my spirit? Would you give me peace in my mind? Would you give me strength in my body as I wait for you? And notice in this verse, he talks about, lest I sleep the sleep of death. He realizes that God doesn't intervene, that his life is on the line. And he doesn't want his enemy to prevail over him. So if you find yourself in a season of waiting, these are great verses to pray. Pray, God, do you see me? God, will you answer me? 
And God, will you strengthen me by your spirit so that I can endure the waiting that I'm in uh, right now? And so we see uh, David praying this prayer. What would it look like if we were to pray more like David? Real, raw, honest, authentic prayers. What would it look like if we prayed more like Jesus? More like Jesus when he was in the garden. God, would you take this away from me? But not my will, but yours be done. Like Jesus on the cross, God, why have you forsaken me? All throughout the scripture, we see teaching about prayer. Let me share with you five ways to pray in waiting Take down these verses, take down these notes. Praying when waiting, pray confidently. Jeremiah 33, three says, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you do not know. Why do we pray confidently? Because God invites us to pray. God calls us to pray to him. God wants us to pray to him. So he says, call to me and I will answer you that, that God answers prayer and there's power in prayer that God will show you great and mighty things that God will show you, reveal some things to you that would not be revealed if you did not pray. And so we need to pray, number one, we need to pray confidently. The second thing is that we pray authentically. Matthew 6, 7, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Don't just throw out all these spiritual terms and pray on and on and on for they think that they're going to be heard by their many words. Just pray authentically from your heart like David has modeled for us. Pray authentically. Pray persistently. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Isn't it interesting that ask, seek, knock, if you take the first letters of those words, it forms the acrostic ask, that that's what God wants us to do, that God wants us to ask, and that God wants us to be persistent, not just praying about it one time, but praying about it all day long, praying about it day after day, month after month, not giving up in prayer. Many of you, as you share prayer requests, it's the same prayer request every week, but you're persistent in your prayer. God is honored by your persistence. Pray persistently. Pray selflessly. So don't just pray for yourself, but pray for others. We see this in Ephesians 6.18, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. What supplication? It's making requests. And to that end, keep alert with perseverance, making supplication, what? For all the saints. So praying for others, not just praying for yourself and your needs, but praying for others and their needs as well. And then lastly, pray expectantly. 1 John 5, 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So pray expectantly. And so God, as I pray this to you, I thank you for hearing me. I thank you for answering my prayers. God, I step out in faith and I trust you that you will be faithful, pray expectant prayers. And so if God seems silent, keep praying, keep asking. But there's something that happens in this Psalm, Psalm 13, the first four verses, uh, David is pouring out his heart in fear, but then all of a sudden he switches to faith. And there is a word that there's a hinge uh, that is the word that's the hinge between fear and faith. It's one small word. It's a common word that we use every day in our English language. It's the first word in verse five. Do you see it? What's the word? But. but. If you're taking notes, here's point number three. Point number three is this. When God seems distant, keep trusting but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. 
So with this one simple yet profound word, David goes from fear to faith. David goes from hopelessness to hope because he is hoping in the steadfast love of the Lord. And we talked earlier about our emotions. Our emotions are uh, good indicators on a dashboard. If you think about warning lights, your emotions are that. Emotions are good indicators. Emotions are terrible GPS systems. Do you see the difference? See, our emotions change. Our emotions go up and down. And so emotions can be good warning lights, but they should never be the thing that is driving you because your emotions can literally drive you off a cliff. Our emotions are not steady and stable, but God is steady and stable. God's love is steadfast. You see this word? But I have trusted in your steadfast love. In the Hebrew, the word would be Hasid, steadfast. What's steadfast? Steadfast is stable. It's steady. It's constant. It's faithful. It's unwavering. And that is who God is. And that is God's love for you. And God's love for your family and God's love for us as a church family. God's steadfast love. Uh, Lamentations chapter three says this, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. That even though there are uncertainties in life, we can be certain about God's steadfast love. So even when God seems distant, keep trusting. When God seems distant, keep trusting. Keep trusting that his ways are higher than your ways. Keep trusting that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Keep trusting that he who has started a good work and you will be faithful to complete it. Keep trusting that God is at work even when you don't see him working when God is distant. Keep trusting. Yesterday I was... Uh, working on this uh, message at a coffee shop outside on a patio. And there was cloud cover. And then the clouds moved, and all of a sudden I'm sitting there in the patio under the bright sun and the warmth of the sun. Isn't that an incredible illustration of life? That even when there are clouds, the sun is still shining even if you don't see it, even in the waiting, God is still working, even if you don't see it. So here is David. David is trusting in his steadfast love. And notice what it leads to next. It's the fourth point. When God's plans don't make sense, keep rejoicing. And I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. That I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Why do we rejoice? Because he has dealt bountifully with us. And what does it mean to be bountiful? Think Costco toilet paper. <laughs> Not like four pack toilet paper but like 100-pack toilet paper. Like if you're going to go to Costco and you're going to get toilet paper and even one more item, you better take two carts because your toilet paper is going to fill the Costco cart. That is bountiful. <laughs> Think endless refills. Bountiful. 
Think 44 ounce porterhouse steak. Bountiful. Think plentiful. Think satisfying. Think fulfilling. Think generous. Hasn't God been generous with us? Hasn't God been generous with his goodness and his grace? We see God's generosity in his son, Jesus. Here, David is writing Psalm 13, and he's writing about feeling forsaken. He's writing about feeling like his enemies are going to win. He's feeling like he's going to experience the sleep of death. But isn't it Jesus who came to earth to be forsaken? That Jesus, as he hung on the cross, he bore our sin and our shame so that we no longer would be forsaken, that we no longer would need to live in shame. And then when Jesus died, it seemed like the enemy had won. But Jesus rose again in victory so that we can have victory. And then it seemed like that that the enemy was going to overcome, but Jesus overcame, and Jesus provided, and Jesus provided forgiveness and life for us, for all who believe. Think about how God has been so generous and gracious to you that he didn't even spare his own son, but he gave his son. He gave his son so that we can have life and that we can have forgiveness and God doesn't forgive partially, but God forgives completely. That God forgives graciously. God forgives gladly. God forgives generously. And so why do we rejoice? Why do we rejoice? Because he has dealt bountifully with me, but here at High Point, we're a Bible church. We believe that every word matters. So let's not miss the first six words in this verse. I will sing to the Lord. I. First, it's personal, I. Second, we see it's volitional. That it's a deliberate declaration. It's a decision. It's a choice. I will The third thing is we see that it's action. I will sing. Not I will withdraw. Not I will complain. Not I will stand with my hands in my pockets. But I will sing. And then fourthly, we see that it's vertical. That I will sing to the Lord. That I won't just sing about the Lord. But I will sing to the Lord. John 4 says that God is looking for worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. What does it mean to worship him in truth? It's to understand who God is and what he has done. And once we understand who God is and what he has done, then it evokes an emotional response in us. That's the spirit part, that we would worship him in our spirit. So we wouldn't just be singing words from our lips but that we would be embracing these truths in our minds and in our hearts and that it would, we would be singing in spirit and in truth. That I will sing to the Lord. And realize here at the end of this chapter, David's life is still a hot mess. His circumstances hasn't changed. What has changed? His change is his perspective from fear to faith, from hopelessness to hope. And hope has a name. His name is Jesus. And so therefore, David is able to say in the midst of his waiting, he is able to worship in the waiting. And we can do the same. One of my uh, favorite worship songs is a song that's familiar to most of us. The song is Yes, I Will. A friend of mine a few years ago made this for me, hand-painted this uh, plaque. 
Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for my heart is heavy. Yes, I will. It's personal. It's volitional. It's action. And it's vertical. I want to invite our worship team to come. And in a moment, they're going to lead us in this song. But before they do, let me just end uh, with this story. That it was March 25, 1965, that Martin Luther King Jr. gave a famous speech on the steps of the state capitol in Montgomery, Alabama. This speech came at the culmination of the march from Selma to Montgomery, a 65-mile march. The title of the message was How Long, Not Long. You see, Martin Luther King Jr. was dealing with racial injustice, and he was asking that question, how long, not long. Here's an excerpt from his speech. How long, not long, because no one can live forever. How long, not long, because you shall reap what you sow. How long, not long, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. How long, not long, because my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord, trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosened the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. In Psalm 13, we started with verses one and two, where David cried out, how long, O Lord? Four times. How long? How long? Not long. Because 2 Corinthians 4, 16 says that we don't lose heart. Even though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Therefore, uh, we don't lose heart because our, this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory that is beyond all comparison. For we look to the things that are seen are, are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So how long? Not long. Because Hebrews 13.5 says that he will never leave you nor forsake you. So how long? Not long because... Romans 8, 28 says that God works all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. How long? Not long. Because Philippians 1, 6 says that he who began a good work and you'll be faithful to complete it. How long? Not long. Because 1 John 4, 4 says greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. How long? Not long. Because even though we are in the depths of the valley, even though our hearts are heavy. We can worship the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so we can worship the name that is above every name because nothing stands against his name. And so together as a church, let's stand Let's stand and let's worship him. Even in our darkest valley, even in when our hearts are heavy, we can worship him. Yes, I will.